So this is the observance night and uh, half moon waning waning moon and tomorrow is the equinox autumn and uh, the year last quarter of the year 2000 is going to be it would be history, like 1999 is now history, a memory. We have just uh, three weeks left of the Vasa. So that's, these are perceptions of time, change on the, on the conditioned realm of convention, like Vasa is a convention. Uh, the this the autumn the doesn't say I'm autumn. It uh, we call it autumn, autumn equinox. <laughs> and uh, but the, so this is a convention that we we use for communication for. Uh, a moral agreements or cultural attitudes that we all uh, subscribe to or use for uh, our conventional reality. And then Paramatta Satcha is the ultimate reality where this is where we we get in beyond a convention. We see conventions are made, they're made up, they're dependent on other things, uh, uh, things that are considered good in one conventional form aren't considered appropriate in another and that we have various uh, biases and prejudices that we get through culture and through uh, the conventions that we have. So just in, in living in Europe, isn't it, we have and just the, the old biases of of what Fra French are like and Germans and Italians and so forth. We have, you know, cultural attitudes, a way of perceiving these things. So we form these these various opinions, views. That's why it's easy to to have like uh, ethnic warfare and race prejudices and class uh, uh, class snobbery and so forth because we we never question the conventional reality that we've adopted we 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 just go along with it so then we we do we hold you know various views about our religion and our race and our culture and 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 then compare it to somebody else's, and then the, on that level, then we uh, there's nothing but uh, you know we try to we have ideals now, say of democracy and equality and all that, but we're still very much influenced by the conventional realities that we're conditioned by. It takes quite a determined effort to get beyond your cultural conditioning. Like, like being, uh, say, uh, American, uh, you think, you know, you, you, you think brought up in a, 
you, you, there's a lot that you just assume, make assumptions from. Like I never realized uh, how arrogant I could be till I had to live in another culture. Or I never saw how, you know, how the American idealism could be another blind spot. You know, it could be like shoving our ideas down everybody's throat, saying America knows what's good for everybody, how they should run their countries. And, <laughs> and yet when you're brought up to think that, that that's, you know, we are somehow the most advanced and so forth, then you, that's an assumption. That I, I don't think that was taught in any intentional way. It was assumed. It was an underlying attitude. So, the, but when you, to get beyond these, uh, these, these assumptions, things we pick up, and, and if we don't even know that, we're, that, we, that we have these attachments, still they're reflected in some way, these, these uh, biases. So that's why living in different cultures, isn't it, helps, for one thing. You know, you, you find... Uh, like going to live in Thailand helped me to see a lot of these things because the culture was so different. And then the, the whole attitude was in living in a Buddhist monastery, so the, uh, the emphasis was on reflection, mindfulness, and wisdom. So I, I just wasn't becoming a kind of uh, ersatz Thai or, uh, you know, just a... Uh, going native, as they say, but it was, it was learning to see what, you know, the, the uh, subtleties of attitude and assumption uh, that, that one uh, is uh, conditioned by that may not be all that easily seen until you find yourself suffering about something. The um, one of the 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 uh, problems that we have in in uh, even meditation is this kind of compulsive compulsiveness. Uh, our society is a very it's a very we're brought up to be very kind of obsessed and com and compulsive. There's so many shoulds when you're coming from ideas. From, uh, from ideas and ideals, and there's the result of that is always there's so many shoulds in your vocabulary, how things should be. And so uh, it's this, this idealism is, you know, has its beauty, not to discard it, but to recognize its limitation, that, that uh, this uh, feeling that there's always something we've got to do there's something we haven't done yet that we should be doing. Uh, we should be working harder than, than we're working. We should be practicing more than we're practicing. We should be more honest than we are. We should be more open. We should be um, more devout. We should be uh, better natured and on and on. Like this. All these are true, you know, as the shoulds are usually right. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, if, if things were perfect, then I would would be, you know, everything would be just perfect, you know. I'd be an ideal, and life, society would be ideal. Amravati would fit the ideal, we'd all be perfect. And so then you could, then there's nothing more you should do because you've already reached the top. But that's not the way life is. An idea is something we create, isn't it? It's, it's like you take your ideas from the best or what's the most kind of beautiful or perfect or fair or just. So the Buddha is pointing to the way life is 
the way it is, which is its changingness. It doesn't stick at the best, doesn't it? You can't, you can't hold anything. And as you're contemplating uh, flowers, for example, you know, like roses, you get sometimes you get perfect rose. I mean, it's just that it's pink. You know, it's just absolutely perfect in its form, its color, its fragrance. But you can't keep it that way. You know, it, it lasts that way very briefly and suddenly it all starts going the other way. And then you just want to get rid of it. Throw it out and get another one. So, the, like with mindfulness, we're aware of this changingness, the way things change. Uh, and Therefore, the uh, and so in in terms of our own experience, their meditation, being aware of how things change, like like moods and feelings. Uh, just the when we when we think of how things should be, then then we get back into ideas again, and then compare ourselves to to maybe ideas that we have what practice is, what good practice is, how many hours a day you should sit in meditation, how, you know, how you should do this, how you should do that, and, and on and on like this, to where we can operate from these ideas that, you know, which are oftentimes very good ideas. But the problem, even if you perform according to all the shoulds, then uh, the, then you, you never, there's always something more, there's always something, it should be better than this, or it, it goes on, you never get to the root of the problem because you just go on and on and you, to, to where uh, there's, there's always this feeling there's something more you've got to do, something you should be doing. And when we reach the end of this, then we give up sometimes. You think, I just had enough of this. To hell with it. <laughs> I'm just going to enjoy life. You know, I'm just going to disrobe and just go out and have a good time and eat, drink, make merry till I die. It's because uh, one can only be driven so far and then, then it just, uh, you're... You're, you can't sustain it. You know, it doesn't work anymore. So the... Just, I mean, to, to listen, to, like should is, is a fair enough, you know, way to think about something. Not the, some people think we shouldn't even think should. <laughs> but uh, but it but to recognize how things affect us, you know, like just noticing the feeling. There's always something more I have to do. Uh, for example, that story about this uh, recurring dream I used to have when I first went to stay with Lung Po Cha, and uh, I'd been in the in the, um, 63, 1963. I finished my master's degree in Berkeley and and that was a year of just uh, you know really compulsive and intense studying where everything I did, I couldn't enjoy anything because every time I you know went out and and tried to enjoy myself I kept thinking oh you've got your exam coming you know you've got to pass your master's degree and and so you know go to a party or try to relax and then this voice and say, you shouldn't be here. You know, you've got to take this exam and you're, you're not ready. You're not good enough for it. And, and so, you know, that whole year I couldn't enjoy anything. I just kind of driving myself. And after I finished the, the Masters, I couldn't read a book for about six months after that. The mind just wouldn't concentrate. I just couldn't. I went through Peace Corps training in Hawaii after that, and, uh, and they wanted me to read all these things. I couldn't read them. I couldn't even read the instructions. 
It was just like overloaded, you know. But that left a kind of intensity of, of the way I would approach anything would be either I can't do it and just give up totally or get into the old compulsive mode. So, so then when I, you know, when I, when I went to uh, David Lung Po Cha, I kept having this recurring dream because I put a lot of effort into my practice, meditation practice. This dream would I be, I'd, I'd be, the, the context would be I'd be going into like a, a cafe or some coffee shop. I'd sit down, order a cup of coffee and, uh, you know, nice pastry. And then the voice would say, you shouldn't be here. You should be studying for the exam. <laughs> And so that would be the the kind of recurring theme of the dream. The, and this dream kept, you know, it was, well, I'd have it quite often. It wasn't one off. And I kept thinking, what's it telling me? And then my compulsive mind kept thinking, there's something I'm not doing that I should be doing. You know, I should be practicing more. I should be more mindful. I should be, uh, I shouldn't be sleeping so much. I, and I wasn't sleeping hardly at all, actually. <laughs> I, <laughs> I kept, th- you know, kept thinking that that this was a message telling me that somehow, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, there's something I'm doing that I, I'm not doing that I should be doing. And uh, so I kept trying to think, what could it be? You know, I can't drive myself any more than what I'm doing, and uh, you know, it just. Didn't, I couldn't figure it out. And then, then one morning I, w- I had this dream, I, w- I woke up and then I had the answer. And the answer was, there wasn't any examination. <laughs> I just realized, that then I'd live my life always like I was going to be tested or brought before the authorities and put to a test. And that I was never ready I mean, uh, never good enough. There's always more. I could study more. I could read more. I could do things more. I shouldn't uh, be lazy, and I shouldn't enjoy life because it, this is this is wasting my time uh, because the exam's coming, and I'm not ready for it. <laughs> and it was a whole kind of uh, emotional conditioning that I'd acquired because uh, the the uh, school systems and the states are very competitive. You start when you're five years old, <laughs> and you just keep going. So, once I had saw that this was the the, the you know I re- uh, that had that insight that there wasn't any that I just thought there was, and I had always lived my life, most of my life, in this attitude that that of that there was going to be a big test that I wasn't prepared for. And maybe it was also from my uh, religious background, where you've got, you, you know, you're going to be tested when you die. You go to the gates, and then whether they let you in or not, <laughs> you know, uh, whether you've been good enough to go to heaven or or you have to go down to hell. You know, so there's there's always this sense of this you you've got to do something. There's a mu- the you're not good enough. You're imper- I'm imperfect. I'm, I have too many faults. I've got to get rid of them. I've got to become something that I'm not. I shouldn't, the way I am is not good enough. And, uh, and so that this, this driven quality, bringing it into monastic life, you know, I, I could, you know, I could do it for a while, but then I realized that if I was going to be a monk, I didn't want to have to live. You know, that wasn't the purpose of the life. And and it wasn't meant to be that way. It was just how I, you know, I was just interpreting monasticism in my, with, the, with this compulsive uh, problem. So I stopped having the dream once I got the answer to the, to the riddle. So 
So then, thinking, you know, when when you really contemplate the Dhamma, and like this morning I was talking about the three first three fetters, like Sakya Ditti, the personality view. We we acquire this when we're born. We're not born with the personality view, isn't it? It's something we acquire. And of course, you can see when you're brought up in a very competitive system, you you have you you see yourself in terms of the comparing yourself to others and to ideals all the time. Your value, your worth is is very much uh, related to what's considered the best and who's the best. And so, if you're not if you don't fit into the best category, then you sometimes see yourself in terms of you know, not being good enough. And even people who see, who I used to think were the best don't usually think of themselves as the best. <laughs> uh, sometimes we think some people uh, are much happier than that, than because we project onto them. We think they're better off than we are. But when the Buddha emphasized mindfulness as the way, then this is pointing to the way things are rather than to the best. So in, when they used to read these uh, in the morning in Wat Pa Pong, they'd have the reading. Uh, um, and uh, they, they'd read these excerpts from suttas about, you know, what a bhikkhu should be and and they were all according to the ideals of what a good bhikkhu is. And uh, so, you know, this was how to interpret this because they were wanting to be the feeling of having to live up to such high standards. Uh, also was a feeling of, you know, can, can I, you know, just, can I really do all that? You know, is it, one can just feel so kind of uh, discouraged or despairing because uh, you're looking at it in terms of ideals. But then the teaching of the Buddha isn't, isn't based on ideals but on Dhamma, the way things are. I mean, like in Vipassana, you, you're really, uh, you know, tuning in to, to impermanence, to transiency, to anicca. Which is, it's, it's not a matter of how things should be, it's the way they are. It's an old conditioned phenomena is impermanent. There's not like conditioned phenomena should be impermanent. <laughs> it is. So it's, it's opening to impermanence. And it's not, not trying to, to, uh, to project this idea onto life, but it's a different using your intuitive mind, isn't it? You open, you watch, you listen, you pay attention. And you, then you're aware of the changingness. And you're aware of even your own compulsive attitudes, like being aware of this compulsive feeling. There's something I gotta do, gotta do it. And, and being aware of that, that awareness of that feeling of that compulsive feeling. Or aware, the, the attitude that I, th I thought was being quite honest and realistic, that I'm not, that I'm, you know, I have, I'm a person with a lot of faults and weaknesses, and that in order to become an enlightened being, I've got to, you know, get over these and, and uh, get rid of them in some way, and become uh, an arhat. So then, this is how the, the mind works, and this is how it's often, you know, how you read it into the scripture. But in, in terms of reflective awareness, you know, when you, when you really notice what, that, that that is something you've created in your mind. I am a person with a lot of faults and weaknesses, and I've got to practice hard in order to overcome them. That's something I'm creating in my mind. I'm creating that, that attitude. I create that. That doesn't, that's not, that's not the truth. 
that is the creation and that which is aware of that then you start beginning to to know the difference between the awakened state of being and what you create into your mind through habit through attachment So like in listening, the one who knows, and like we use this Puto or the, the name Buddha itself is a, is a significant word because it, it's putting us into that state, pointing to a state of attention, of knowing directly, of intuitive awareness, of wisdom. So there's no person that you not say, you know, if you start thinking, I'm Buddha, then that, um, you know, that coming from personality again. Identity, and thinking, thinking I'm, I am the Buddha, and that's another, uh, that doesn't work. But uh, we call refuge in Buddha, or Bhutang Sarnangachami, it gives us a, that's a kind of convention too, but it points to a reality. Uh, that we can begin to trust in, which is awareness. Because the Buddha is the Bhutto, the one who knows, that which knows, which is awake and aware. And it's awakeness. It's not, it's not judgment, judgmental, critical. The Buddha isn't saying, you should be like this and you shouldn't be like that and, and all that. It, it's knowing that the all conditioned phenomena is is like this, it's changing. Where sometimes we brought up, like we brought up in a religion like Christianity, where God tells you what you should be. And at least this is my, my, uh, the way I was taught. You know, how you should be a good boy and <laughs> And that every time you're bad, you hurt God's feelings. I was brought up to think that <laughs> if I told a lie, you know, God would be very, you know, disappointed in me. And and so you you always, you know, this is kind of a moral training as a, as a child. Really, it's what your parents think, isn't it? You you it's all mixed up with per parent perception of parents and. And God is a kind of uh, parent, parental figure. So awakeness then isn't is is uh, is learning to listen and to trust in in just the most simple state of being. It's not like jhana or or uh, absorption in anything. It's, it's pure attention. And so it is pure. It's, uh, so if you trust in, in this purity, then there are no faults in purity, is there? It's perfect. There's no, if, if it's pure, there's no impurities. So this is where to trust in this in this attentiveness to the present. Because once you, once you try to find it, it's pure, you know, you try, is there any, then you start going into doubt, you know. So you don't, don't trust it rather than think about it. Just in the imminent act of being awake, attentive in this moment. So in this, when I do this, then my mind relaxes into this. I hear the sound of silence, and then this. There's no self. There's purity. There's no self. And and if I start feeling now, if the conditions arise around, I should be doing so. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it as the condition. Uh, the the vipaka kama, of having been through the American educational system and driven myself uh, to this incredibly compulsive way of doing, of, uh, of uh, living one's life. So the vipaka come arises, you know, say, you should be and shouldn't be and all that, but in this, in this, 
state of purity and of pure attention, it's not personal, it's not saying I'm pure now, Ajahn Sumedho's pure. It's beyond that. It's not, it's not a personal, uh, you're not talking about it in any personal way, but it's a recognition, a realization. It's what you really are, it's the true nature of things, it's not, not a creation. I'm not creating the purity. I'm not kind of creating an ideal of it and, and then deluding myself with it. But this is where it is trusting because, because your, your personal personality view is not going to trust it. Your personality is going to come and say, hmm, nothing pure about you. You, you, you know, you just had some dirty thoughts and, and you were, you know, really looking pretty, uh, you know, really... Uh, uh, feeling pretty upset and angry about something somebody said to you the other day and what kind of, you can't, you're certainly full of impurities. You know, you're not, after all these years, you're still filled with impurities. And this is the old uh, uh, t- inner tyrant. This is the, the uh, personality view. Personality view is the, is the tyrant, is the, is the victim, is the, victimizer it's poor me I'm so impure and it's the, the accuser you are not good enough you're impure it's both <laughs> so it's, uh, you can't trust it don't take <laughs> don't take refuge in being a victim or, or in being a victimizer that you can trust in, in this, this awakened awareness. And that trust is humbling. It doesn't, it isn't like believing in something, but it's, it's learning to relax and be. Trust in, in, in just the, 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 the ability to just be here and open and receptive to this, whatever is happening now, even if what's happening is unpleasant or nasty or whatever the conditions you're experiencing are, the present is not the, it's not, that's not a problem if you trust in this impurity. Like trying to, like with, with the vinya, for example, the, the idea of trying to keep the vinya pure and and because the the whole personality view attaches to even the vinya am I pure enough in this and my vinya is purer than somebody else's or not as pure and and on and on like that then you, you never you, you know it's, you're just using this 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 convention uh, to, uh, to increase the sense of personal worth or worthlessness. So if you think you're more pure than the rest, that's arrogant, holier than thou. And then if you think you're always impure, then, then you know, you're going to get feel hopeless. You know, you just feel, can't do it. Better to go and, go and, get drunk or something, at least forget about it for a while, relax and have a good time. <laughs> Always then, then beating yourself up by your ideals of not being pure enough. Conventions themselves are limited, you know, they're, they're, their nature is imperfect and changing. So, in, like in our convention, you know, maybe you expect even the convention to be perfect. And then when you, you know, then you become, after a while, you, you can become very critical of the convention because you can see flaws in it or it isn't, you know, it doesn't, isn't as good as you thought or some of it isn't, doesn't make sense or things like this. But recognize that the convention isn't, you know, it's 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 anicca dukkha natha, just like every other convention. But it is a convention based on 
say, morality, doing good and refrain from doing evil with action and speech. So it's an agreed way of living where we agree to, to take responsibility for how we live in this planet, on this society. The convention we have, like Theravada Buddhism, is, you know, you can find many things you may not like or, or find all that agreeable to you, but, but it is a, it is a tradition. There's, you know, there's a lot of power from being so old and ancient and still useful. You know, it's still a viable tradition that, that works. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, so it has its, uh, you know, it's not a matter of, of it having to be perfect for us to use, but learning to use it for awakened awareness. Then we get into the old Buddhist context, like the Mahayana, and then Vajrayana, and then you, and the Hinayana, and then you think, we're, we're considered Hinayana, lesser vehicle, and we think, that means it's probably not as good. Mahayana is better. Logic, isn't it? Lesser vehicle, uh, and greater vehicle, and then the Vajrayana, and that's the absolute, the best. You can't get better than Vajra, according to the Tibetans. That's the highest vehicle. So that, then we, we start thinking in terms of good, better, best. And these, uh, with, but all of these are conventions. You know, whether it, you call it Mahayana, Hinayana, Vajrayana, they're conventions. They're limited. They're, they're you know, they're, they're imperfect. They're functional. They're at, you know, to use them because they for mindfulness rather than for some kind of uh, attachment or, or position that one takes on anything. So they can be very divisive if we attach to Theravada and then we start looking down on every other form of Buddhism. And then, and then we think they're Mahayana or they're not, they're not the pure. They're not the original. They're higher or greater, but not original. And we, we can get arrogant because we've, we've got our own way of justifying our convention. But this is all just playing with words, isn't it? When you look right at what's going on, it, you're just creating Mahayana, Hinayana, Vajrayana in your mind. Because the, no, the, the refuge is in Buddha, not in these yanas and these and, and the Buddha it knows that every thought, anything is 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 uh, you know in, in changing and non-self. So trust in that, in the simplicity of that, rather than because if you don't, then you're going to it is going to arouse your old compulsive habits of thinking. I've got to do more, I've got to develop this, I've got to become a bodhisattva, I've got to get the higher practice going, I've got to, and on and on like that. And so it just, the, the whole, when, we, when you're caught in that conventional realm, and that's all you know, then, you, then you're easily intimidated and blinded by all the dazzling kind of positions and attitudes and ideas that people can throw at you. So this is where trusting in awareness, and then you, not a matter of having the best, but of, 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 of feeling that maybe you've got, you should have the, something better than what you have. That's a creation of your mind, isn't it? When you establish, like in terms of, of what is uh, adequate, like, in, like for monasticism, Buddhist monasticism, it's not based on on having the best, but on what's adequate? Are the four requisites adequate? You don't have to be the best. You don't have to have the best food and the best robes and all that. Uh, but adequate, 
good enough? Can it, can, is it survival? Is there any problem in, pla- in you know, having a place to stay or medicine for sickness? No. It doesn't have to be a, the, the very best. But it's, in fact, the, the standard is oftentimes established at the lowest point, you know, like rag robes rather than, than uh, silk robes. Then the, the Dhamma, Dhamma Vinaya is, is respected and taught. So these are, these are things that are very, you know, which give us a sense of whether, you know, the, you know, it's a place we can, we can live. Standards aren't placed at the best, you know, it has to be the very best, but if the Dhamma is taught and the Vinaya is respected, the four requisites are adequate. It's good enough. So go for it. go for the practice rather than and, and quibble around the rest. You now whether you like the teacher or not, or whether you you know, it, it's better to to use the 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 awareness to develop awareness rather than to to go along with one's uh, feelings of criticism or doubts and problems in the with dealing with the people in the place you're in I was uh, you know just contemplated the, in myself this this compulsive attitude until I really could see it you know, got to, I must. And, and, and it is very insidious because it, it's so, it wasn't, you know, just, you know, one time off insight, but it was reminded myself of how, you know, how this is a, more or less how I approach life in general. Full of shoulds and feelings I've got, there's something I've got to do. I should be doing something or I shouldn't. And just noticing, listening to this, and learning to relax and trust in the refuge. Which is very humbling, because it doesn't seem like anything. It's not like, you know, it doesn't, it seems like it's not worth anything. And it doesn't seem like anything much. So you just say, just attention in the present. So what? (laughs) I want something I should be doing. You know, tell me what to do next. How many hours should I be sitting? How many hours should I be walking? And what should I be developing? Should I do more metta and and more (laughs) like this? Because we want something to do and we feel very ill at ease when there's nothing to do, nowhere to go. So in, uh, like in monastic life, we do offer structure. In that if you have conventions and structures, you have a, you know, morning puja, evening puja, and then you've got fortnightly recitations and so forth. So you have a, a form, conventional form to you. Is you know to to do something, and then uh, we chanting and and uh, bindabata and all these things are are you know some part of a, a of a tradition. So it gives, uh, and, but from these these this 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 uh, structure. It's to, it's to help us to observe, like sila for behavior, and uh, the structure for for uh, a community. Or say when people go on the self retreat, then they they kind of let go of the structure, then they're thro- thrown onto their own, you know. And how what happens when you're thrown left on your own? You know, nobody knows what you're doing. 
So you don't have to kind of look around, see if senior monks looking at you and on and on like that. You know, you, you're left to your own devices. So you could sleep all day, or you could, you know, read novels, or or go for long walks, and or you could you know, really practice hard and, uh, or, you know, you, there's a all different range of, of possibilities that's left up to you. And to notice that feeling of, of, uh, you know, when the, when the structure's removed, what, what happens? And not in a judgmental way, like, they bring back the should. Like I should practice so many hours a day, sit so many hours, walk so many hours, and 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 do this and do that in order to, you know, get my practice, get my samadhi, and really get somewhere in my practice. And and that, and not that that's wrong, but that that uh, can be, you know, that's that's also uh, maybe a very compulsive thing. And when you and if you don't live up to it, then what do you feel like? You know, do you feel guilt-ridden if you don't do what you've determined to do? And to notice, what, what, you know, how we, how the mind works and, and awaken to it. It's easy if, you know, if everybody, if you have a, a strong leader that says, oh, now you do this and you do that, and you, everybody come and everybody leave and everybody, you know, march in step and, and so forth. And this, this uh, is good training also. But that also brings up now, some people that don't like it, then they start they're resisting it, rebelling against it. Or other people love it because they can't, they don't know what to do if they're if nobody's telling them what to do next. <laughs> so they don't know how to how to operate. <laughs> and they like the security of everything controlled and and everything held together by a strong leader. But recognize that, 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 that this uh, monastic life, the thing is, is for awakening. And, and a strong leader or nobody else can make you do it. You know, it's, I can kind of browbeat you into conformity, you know, get heavy and, and uh, kind of browbeat you into or manipulate you emotionally by saying, if you really want to please me, you will do this. <laughs> if you really want my approval, I won't give you my approval if you don't um, behave properly and things like this, then I can kind of use uh, my, uh, you know, emotional uh, power to to try to control and manipulate the situation but that that's not something that you know is is uh, skillful that's not what we're here for so the the onus is on each one of us isn't it is, is waking up and and only that that's but don't think I have to wake up because I John tomatoes <laughs> but learning to to recognize and appreciate in yourself just a simple imminent act of attention, open, uh, relaxed listening, being here and now, just learning to 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 re recognize that, to appreciate that more and more and trust it. Because you're emotionally probably programmed for the other. The, the you should and you shouldn't. So wanting to to give uh, you know an occasion 
a, a situation, uh, opportunity, encouragement, um, all this is, you know, like, like uh, what we're trying to do here, just, you know, give the, uh, a situation where uh, you're encouraged to trust in this. And, and to cultivate this way. When we say cultivate, then that, that's, that's not like having to do anything. It's learning more to relax and trust in being. The flow of life. Because we are, you know, life is like this. And so, so life changes, you know. The, we can see this in the past year, how the changes at Amravati from it building and and opening ceremony and all the kind of uh, ambience around that, and now it's it's that that period's over. It's changed. It's different like this. I remember, you know, just in in with Wat Pa Pong, just uh, feeling when I first went there, it was. It was such a kind of esprit de corps, you know. We were really there with Lung Po Cha. There's only 22 monks, and we were, you know, we were really getting somewhere, and we were really crack troops, top grade, top guns. And then a few years later, you know, the, you know, seeing things I didn't like, and and getting very critical of it, and thinking it's all falling apart. And then I saw it fall apart. With Lung Po Cha, when he had his stroke, and I remember going to, mm. a few years after he had his stroke, going to Wat Pa Pong, and in Wat Pa Pong they had the inner monastery, where the monks lived, and then they, they had an outer part where they had a special kind of Kuti set up for Lung Po Cha, which was allowed for nursing care and all kinds of things. And then they had an outer sala where people come. So you go to the outer sala and nobody was nobody wanted to come to the monastery. They all they came to see was Lung Po Cha, who was ill and couldn't talk or do anything. All the emphasis was in the his kuti and and then no monks wanted to live there and and uh, and I remember going in. There were only three monks one time in the huge monastery. Ajahn Liam and a few others. And the place was looking pretty shabby. And it was usually spick and span and uh, and clean. And it, you know the, the standards of order were very high there. And it was sweeping the paths and and repairing everything. And then. Then you go in, it's like a ghost town. You know, just the cooties, the empty cooties that, are, that are, need repairing and are dirty and dusty and the paths not swept and so forth. And I remember some Bangkok people coming to me and saying, Oh, it's, it's, it's no good anymore. Ajahn Liam can't teach. He's no. And they complain. They say, We want you to come back and be the abbot. They're thinking I should go back and uh, and take over. Not <laughs> but they they wanted, you know, they the people were just, you know, real, you know, it had changed in a way that they they just felt uh, it shouldn't be like that. But in but now it's back into its, its you know, fifty monks and. And it's all, you know, it's all operating in, uh, in full capacity. But, I mean, it's changes. Things change. Now, are we open to change? We're not demanding that it change in any way that we want it. Or, or that when it's at its peak that we can, can keep it at uh, that peak. It, it's impossible. So that... And even in yourself, you know, you, to be aware when you're at your best, when you're at your worst, when you're, you're feeling really good and inspired and love the life, when, you, when you're feeling down and despairing, lonely and depressed and disheartened, 
these are the, the this awareness is your refuge, where the changingness of feeling, of attitude, of of mood, but you know, of material change, of emotional change. Then stay with that because the refuge is indestructible. You know, it's it, it's not something that changes. It, uh, it's, it's something you can, it's a refuge you can trust in. But that refuge is not something you create. It's not a creation. It's not an ideal. It's, it's very practical and very simple, but, it's, uh, but easily overlooked or not noticed. So when, when you're mindful, you're beginning to notice like this. Like when I remind myself, this is this is this is pure. This moment, and I and I and I really make a note of this. This is this is this is the path. This is purity. Not 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 a, anything I'm creating, but just this this. This, this state of attention, of, of relaxed, not attention like a tongue, but it's more like, more like relaxed attention. Listening, open, receptive. And then, and as you r relax into that, then you, it, it, you know, it's a natural state, not a created state, it's not is not dependent on on uh, conditions making it that way. It's just we forget it. There's a problem. We forget it all the time. So we go get thrown back into the old habits every time. And this is why with mindfulness you're remembering it more, trusting it more. Then it's cultivating, cultivating this in this way of just leading yourself back all the time right to this 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 awareness and then you get carried away again and then forgot again and keep doing that and uh, it, it, and it, no matter how uh, recalcitrant or difficult or wild your your emotions and thoughts may be all right, you know this. This is this. This is what this is the refuge. And to apply that to everything, you know, like like uh, being personally wounded, like like when somebody says something very hurtful. I had question: What is it that gets hurt? If somebody insults me or or abuses me in some way, I feel hurt, I feel misunderstood, and I feel offended and annoyed or even angry. What is it that gets angry and annoyed and gets offended, you know? It's, is that anything, is that my refuge? That which, whose feelings get hurt and gets offended and gets upset. If I'm in this refuge, the refuge never gets upset by anything. You can call it anything you want. <laughs> but as a person, then I can be easily upset. As a person, you can upset me very easily. <laughs> so, I mean, because the personality, the psychiatry is like that, you know, it's based on you know, me is worthwhile or worthy of being, uh, you know, appreciated or not appreciated and being understood properly or misunderstood or, or respected or I'm not respected enough or, you know, all this kind of thing. I'm just, uh, then my personality is, uh, you go, oh, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, wide open to be hurt, to be offended, to be upset by anything. But that's not my ref my personality is not my refuge. It's not what I would advise as being a refuge. 
because it, if your personality is anything like mine, it <laughs> it, I wouldn't for a minute want to recommend even you taking refuge in my personality. <laughs> but, in, but in awareness, yes. Because awareness is pure and it, it doesn't, you know, if you trust it more and more, then it, you're, even though you're feeling hurt and upset and, and disrespected and unloved and unappreciated, the awareness knows that is a Nietzsche. It's, it's not judging, it's not making any problem, it's just fully accepting the feeling of nobody loves me, everybody hates me feeling and that goes, it goes away naturally, it drops because its nature is changed. So this evening we have, uh, this is the, the midnight hour, isn't it? So everybody's invited to join in the observance?